Hey, yes, good to be able to talk with you. This so is a real I, feel treat. Like, uh, I feel like I know you. I mean, I feel like I met you three years ago, four years ago. Three me years too. Ago. Well, I feel like I, you know me and I know you, and I'm just so grateful. We'll be forever grateful for the review you wrote of Cuz. Oh, for I'm the Washington forever Post. grateful for Cuz. So, it was an incredible, incredible book. Yeah. Incredible. Well, heavy as well. Likewise, I just love that. Your, your work is incredible. So Thank I'm just you. really, you. it's a pleasure to be here with you. And with Diva too, I don't have you guys met before? Because Diva's also really extraordinary. Oh, yes, I just know Diva's work. I never met Diva before. Mm -hmm. I'm just a fan um, uh, of both of your work, obviously. Uh, and I'm so excited to be able to be in conversation with you and to be able to talk to you. Um, I do want to begin at the beginning. Uh, in a conversation about history and the American imagination, I think it's really important that we define our terms. Right, first of all, right, because um, even though it's a kind of very sweeping title um, with, uh, you know, pregnant with implications, I think that we should all be uh, aware of for the people in this conversation what those terms mean. Right? So I want to ask you both uh, in turn what do you think the American <laughs> imagination is? Um, or put in a different way, what is the American imagination and how is it shaped by history? And then as a kind of corollary to that question, how does memory relate to the notion of history? Especially since memory is plural and it always intersects with power, something that both of your works show so effectively um, and hauntingly, really. So what kind of work do you think that you all's memories um, as they are recorded in your memoirs, are doing in this kind of um, this intersection between history, memory, and imagination in the American context. Well, should Say I jump I, in? Yeah, yeah either one. <laughs> okay. I'll jump in. I'll jump in. Thank you for that question, Diva. It's so important. So, what is the American imagination? I think of it as the imagination of a self-made people. And I don't mean by that the idea that it's all a group of people who have all been pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. I mean the fact that we are a people who come from all over with all kinds of stories of lineages and ancestors, indigenous people who are here originally, people who came as enslaved people, or their ancestors came as enslaved people, people who came as immigrants. And in that regard, to become a single society, we have had to make ourselves. So we are collectively a self-made people. And so our imagination consists of the stories we use to convince ourselves that we belong together or not. And I think that that is really what the American imagination is as a kind of, is a fight over the kinds of stories that can make sense of our all thinking we do belong to the same thing in some sense. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. You know, when I was in um, undergrad, I got to work with Calvin Herrington, who's since passed. Calvin was obsessed with uh, Toni Morrison, as we all were. And um, it was right around the time Toni Morrison really started talking about American literary imagination a lot, almost in every speech. And I was just, I, I just could not understand what it meant. And um, Calvin was lucky enough to uh, put me on speakerphone when she, he was talking to her in his office one day in Oberlin. And she was just like, it's work. And I was like, what do you mean? And, you know, she's like, imagine, like, look it up. You know, she, she, she was from that era, people were just like, look up the word. And she, she wanted me to understand that it meant that it, it was work, like work at um, solving a problem, right? The imagination. And so ever since then, I haven't been able to think about imagination without thinking about imagine. And I haven't been able to think about imagine without thinking about the work that it takes to solve a problem. Now, the problem, I think, comes in in this country because we're so good at acting like problems are not problems if they harm the most vulnerable, right? So how do you work to make, to, to, to fix a problem that the nation insists on seeing as not a problem or insists on seeing as a problem that has nothing to do with the making of a nation? So that's why I love your question and I'm, I'm super excited to dig deep because I just think it's always work, right? Like I still have no idea what Toni Morrison meant, but I know that it has something to do with work. That's really interesting to me. 
I love the idea of imagination as work because the physical definition of work, right? Like in physics, right? The concept of work is um, when a force moves an object in the intended direction. Um, and, and then if, you do, if it moves in a different way, it's called negative work. So I love the idea of imagination um, as work, right? Imagination as a force that moves um, in an intended direction. Um, I think that's super illuminating. Okay, so the second part of that question is what kinds of, maybe, and I can put it in these terms now, right? What kinds of work um, do you think that your American imaginings, right? Uh, what kind of work do you want them to do, right, in this context? So I'm going to bring in Ralph Ellison for a minute here, actually, because Toni Morrison often Expected. <laughs> Ralph Ellison. Yeah, but also but in exactly this context of what is the American imagination and what does it mean? And in the same way that Casey was describing himself as being stuck on this comment from Morrison, I got really stuck on a comment from Ellison in one of his essays, where he calls out Ernest Hemingway as a kind of quintessential example of the problem in the American imagination. And he's sort of asking this question, like, why is Hemingway obsessed with bullfighting? Why is he obsessed with damaging innocent creatures and the sort of the gore and the violence of that? And the answer is because, you know, Americans have had a habit over centuries of damaging innocent fellow human beings. And so sort of displaced through that sort of uh, really graphic depiction of, of Hemingway and that sort of thing. And I got really stuck on that because I just really couldn't understand how it was that this sort of description of Spanish bullfighting, which felt like it had nothing to do with America, counted actually as a kind of quintessential articulation of the problem of the American imagination. And over time, I came to understand that what Ellison was really saying is that the American imagination is also about how we workshop our moral problems. I think that's what Kiesi is saying too. So for me and Cuz, right, the job is to workshop our moral problems, to name them, to bring them to the surface, to show their texture dynamics in terms of the harms and also the helps that human beings give each other. So that for me, I guess, is how I come to define that work concept that you're both putting on the table. Yes. I, I just wanna add like, it, that makes so much sense to me what Danielle is saying. And I think, especially if we think about the battle royale as a workshopping of America's obsessions slash imaginations slash refusal to reckon with memory right like like that 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 battle royale is among other things i think people talk and think about it as a spectacle but it it's a workshop right of the american imaginary um and i never thought about that before but yeah yeah definitely. for sure for sure, yeah. Yeah, and we can also think about the work of storytelling, right? Um, so the ways that, and this is, I found this also in your writing as well, these, these sort of parallels and resonances that were in kind of different registers, but when read together, um, were very enlightening. So I really like the idea that the stories that we use to convince ourselves that we belong together um, in the context of this notion of work, right? The work of this kind of storytelling. Okay, so so I want to move on to a, another question, and this is one that's about um, how we deal with sacrifice um, and loss, and how we evaluate, um, you know, what's too much to bear. I guess so. Um, so Danielle Allen asserts that fundamental to the functioning of any democracy is the acceptance and acknowledgement of loss and the inevitability of sacrifice. But how ought we to contend with a history and a reality in which loss is structurally disproportionate? Or in Kiese Lehman's terms, when the abundance of some, particularly black and brown people, poor people, women and queer folk, is ever recognized as meager? Kiese, yes. I've been going first each time. So I'll, let you, I'll let you go first this time. Yeah, you know, I read that question probably like two o'clock in the morning and, and, and it kept me up. Um, be, be, because it kept me up partially because of something I was talking about with Layla and I was talking about with, later with Hannah. It, it seems that like, in some way, the, the, the con one of the conditions that we, I'm just gonna talk about black folks right now, that we as black folks and black critics and black art creators in this country, like, it seems like love of America, because I want to tie this to what you said earlier about reckoning. Love of America is a precondition to be accept, preconditioned to be accepted, right? In this mass way. And 
and and even Baldwin, I talked about this before, you know, I love America more than any other country in the world. Therefore, I insist on the right to perpetually criticize her. But like, why don't we have the right to perpetually criticize someone who has been completely unloving to us? Right. And so I'm thinking about not just love and reckoning, but also this 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 idea of patriotism when you ask that question. Because I'm working through that. Too. Like, I don't think I, I mean, my entire life I've been working on that Baldwinian model. Like, I love America, therefore I can criticize her. You know, my grandmother's about to die. And if she dies, and I think about what the country has done to her. And sometimes I think, I think my grandmother becomes a proxy for America. I'm like, I love my grandmother so much. But then when I think about my, what, what this country has done to my grandmother, I'm just not sure anymore that I need to be an artist who sort of like, like foregrounds my love of the nation before I criticize her. No, I'm gonna criticize you because of the unlove that you showed to my grandma. You know, so that might not sound like the answer to that question. But when I read that question last night, I kept trying to tease through what what is the difference between a sort of loyalty, a, a, a rugged reckoning, a rugged love and patriotism, which doesn't seem rugged at all, you know? So I like that phrase, a rugged love, a lot. And I think for me, I would use it to flip the conversation a little bit. So for me, it's very easy to talk about love of country. For me, I have, I have no question about being able to talk about love of country. I also see all the wrongs in our country. But for me, that the reason it's not hard is because love of country starts at home with mm. my people and the places I grew up and the places they grew up and the networks of stories and so forth. And so I feel like, you know, for me, when I say I love my country, I'm starting, that's an ownership claim. And for me, that's also the beginning of a redefinition. So mm -hmm. my love of country is not in the first instance, a love of some abstract, complete mass whole. It's sort of, no, no, these are my trees. This is my right. sky. This is the geography within which I orient myself and the histories that give my life shape and meaning. And I love these things I have been given and the people who have given them to me, they are my country. And so then from there, I then more or less seek a redefinition of the country as a whole. Mm -hmm. If the thing I love is not visible in the definition of the country as a whole, I take it as my job to make it part of the definition of the country as a whole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what about this notion of sacrifice though? Um, what are so, we to make of, of that? Yeah. Right. No, I mean, it's, you, you asked the question and um, a passage from my book popped into my head, which is not my own words, but my cousin Michael's words. So my book, Cuz, is about my beloved younger cousin who went to um, prison at the age of 15 on a first arrest and um, basically was um, dead, roughly speaking, 13 years after that um, through the journey that his life took from that point on. And there's a rap of his, he wrote a lot while he was incarcerated. Um, huge amounts of beautiful, beautiful writing. The book was really just an excuse to publish his writing at the <laughs> end of the day. And there's a rap where he's really invoking the image of his mother and he uses a biblical image of Harriet on bended knee. And Harriet is, you know, is, is, is working so hard for her sons to deliver the good for them. And so she has sacrificed so much and there's blood on her knees because of all the sacrifice she has given for her sons. And I do think that image captures you know, sacrifices that have been asked of people of color in this country over time in durable and persistent ways. And it is too much, it is too much. And so it leaves you with a paradox where you have to both, as my cousin Michael was doing for his mother, honoring her, honoring her by recognizing that sacrifice. But then there's the question of transformation because that is asking too much. Harriet has suffered too much. And when we see that story of sacrifice and we honor her, what we're actually also seeing is um, the necessity of transformation in terms of what we ask of one another. So sacrifice is part of what makes communities without any question, and we have to honor it, but we also have to be able to draw lines and say where it's too much and where that means there's a, a marker in place, a call for transformation. Yeah, and, and so much of this too, Danielle, when you say that makes me think about the way you know, market-driven <laughs> market culture means that anything is able to be consumed, especially sacrifice, like in, in my life, in my culture, Mississippi. And so I absolutely agree. And I'm just not sure what to do with the fact that one of the things I know this country will, will in, invariably do is consume the sacrifice of people who were critical of it and spit out the, the critique of the actual like 
consumer of the sacrifice. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, obviously, to do this with King, people have tried to do it with X. They're now actually trying to do it with Fannie Lou Hamer. They'll do it with my grandmother. They'll do it with us. So, like, the, yes, we all must sacrifice. Like, that is part of our birthright. But, but sadly, I also think it's part of our birthright to have that sacrifice consumed nationally or on a state level if you live somewhere like Mississippi or maybe anywhere else. Um, and, and that's the part that, that scares me. And, and if sacrifice is consumed, Yes, of course, it's sacrifice internally, right? But 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 what does that consumption of sacrifice actually do to this nation and do to the people who perpetually have to sacrifice? And I think it makes their their um, grandchildren and great grandchildren have to ultimately sacrifice more. So I mean, there's from my point of view, there's no question that perpetual sacrifice is unjust, is an injustice, right? And so in the same argument, Diva, that you cited, that's where the argument goes: is one to draw a line between the kinds of sacrifices that members of a democratic society who are on equal footing make for each other and can honor, and the kinds of sacrifices that are turned into scapegoating in effect, um, because it's, it's permanent, it's durable, um, it's perpetual. So when I think about the concept of sacrifice, for me, um, it's not, it is a question of honoring sacrifices people have made, but there's also a question actually of what kinds of sacrifices um, we need to ask of the powerful. Um, the powerful have to sacrifice. And what they have to sacrifice, from my point of view, is power. Um, and so that's the hard question of our politics, is how to reorganize all of our structures of decision making on an egalitarian footing so that people are sharing power. And I actually think that's the hardest sacrifice um, to ask for, to drive forward, um, to bring about transformation in relationship to, is a sacrifice of power. That's a harder thing to get people to give up than actually money. Yeah, you know, um, I, this is a question that I think about all the time. Um, and I share Kiese's um, worry uh, about um, the endless appetite for sacrifice. I mean, that's how, you know, sort of, we think about in ancient societies, like that's what would happen, right? The sacrifice was just sort of regular um, and there would be no, um, there was no sort of appeal or, um, you know, it was assumed that the sacrifice was necessary. So, but at the same time, um, you know, the hope is always what you say, Danielle, is that you can, that there's some remedy. Um, but I, I'm a, I, I feel like perhaps um, what I hope that people do uh, during this period and what I do see certain social movements doing um, is to create an ethical frame in which you can actually pinpoint um, um, when sacrifice is too much and then what to do about it, right? Absolutely. What to do about it. Um, so that brings me to this question of reckoning. Before right? you go there, can I just okay. sure. follow up one thread of what you said? Yeah. Because I think we can put those pieces together. The demand to lead, I would say, is simultaneously a request for sacrifice, for an acceptance of sacrifice. So I agree with you. This is not about being in a position of making requests. Um, it is about stepping up and simply leading and insisting on that place in that position. And I think what I'm adding into the analysis is simply to recognize that that's not a cost-free action. Everybody knows that, we know it's not cost-free. But one way of thinking about what's happening in that moment is that that demand to lead is also introducing a request for acceptance of a sacrifice. A request in the sense that one wants to achieve solidity and legitimacy for that leadership, not have it be contested. So one is actually seeking acquiescence in that insistence on leading. And I do think there's a structure of exchange there that it serves us well for us to build a healthy society to recognize. I kind of, I mean, I hear that. And I think there's evidence for that. So I have in mind, for example, the movement for black lives, which very um, sort of, you know, explicitly all the time says, um, we are leading, right? Like, like black people are leading. Um, you're gonna, um, you know, in order to be um, in allyship with this movement, then you have to accept the leadership of black people and black women in particular. But okay, so maybe it's a part of this thing that we are keep calling, or at least people keep calling colloquially, a reckoning. Um, so because I love definitions, I'm gonna say again. <laughs> but I do. I. It's just so important for clear thinking. So reckoning to remind us, right? means the action or process of calculating or estimating something. 
It also means a person's view, opinion, or judgment, or a bill or account and its settlement. Okay, so this current moment has been called a reckoning. Um, and the matter that we're reckoning, right, is of some debate, right, whether it's white supremacy, empire, patriarchy, late capitalism, or all of the above. But however one comes down on the question of what we are to be accounting for, almost everyone agrees that this is a moment when a judgment is being rendered. And when we're estimating the cost and focusing, not for the first time, but perhaps in a unique way, on how to conceive of what is owed and to whom. So what place do you think that artists and educators like yourselves have in helping to calculate the losses of America's history, America's present and America's legacy? And how do we begin to imagine remedies? Is this work that Americans are even capable of doing together? Ooh. <laughs> uh, you know, every professional part of me wants to say, of course we're capable, but that would be a lie. Do you know what I mean? Um, this is like the real talk part of the conversation, I think. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure what we mean when we talk about reckoning on social media and whatnot, and everybody's like, believe Black women, but very few people want to do the work to talk about why they've made black women sacrifice so much, right? So it's easy to jump to black women, you know, believe black women. It's much harder to talk about how I don't believe black women. And so, you know, anytime I, I think this is where Baldwin is really crucial. I think when you jump to this deliverance without doing the hard work of interrogating, yes, the interiority of the individual and the massive mangled interiority of the nation, I think these things become speech acts, they become pep rally stuff. And I love a pep rally, you know, I love a pep rally. But I've seen very little evidence that folks with absolute power in this nation are willing to do the hard work of thinking about how they've made my great grandmother, your great grandmother, Danielle's great grandmother, Fannie Lou Hamer, sacrifice. Do you see what I'm saying? So, so like, I, I don't know what reckoning actually means the way we throw the word around. It, it, it seems a little bloodless. It seems, or it seems to rely on the same blood that is always relied upon. I have no, there's nothing, there's no proof or trust in my, in my actual life that says that people saying believe black women are going to believe black women. If you don't talk to me about when you don't, why you don't and when you haven't, you're not going to, you know what I'm trying to say? So I don't like to be the pessimist <laughs> really ever, but I, I, I have lots of doubts today, you know, mm -hmm. lots of doubts today. Mm -hmm. Danielle? So um, I, for me, this takes us back to the beginning of the conversation and the concept of work. Okay? Mm. And I'm not even going to probe the question of why it is I am, people keep calling me indefatigable, okay? It's sort of, <laughs> I've discovered that this is a word that sticks to me somehow. <laughs> You're indefatigable. I have like a ridiculous, insane appetite for work. And I recognize that that is, I think, you know, it's a part of my own tradition, right? I come from a line of women who have been indefatigable and have an appetite for work, but why? Because honestly, there isn't an option because not to find the pathway to rectification is to, to is defeat and because I will not be defeated. So does that mean it's not massively hard work? Not at all. Uh, you know, I literally, honestly, okay, in my private moments, I think of it as hand-to-hand -hand combat, I'll tell you the right. truth, okay? So absolutely, and it sort of exists in our cultural life when to be, as Du Bois said, a co-creator in the kingdom of culture is about literally fighting to make room for ways of talking and voices that are not validated by the things at the center of the conventions of American prose and really like struggling to tear open and make space. People are always telling me my sentences are written the wrong way around or they're, they're backwards. <laughs> you know, like literally, like I, I like, you know, 
lead into the verb and then land on the subject. That is a way of talking. It's actually grammatically, it makes perfect grammatical sense. You can find whole cultural context where people talk that way. And you have to like use your elbows to make space for it inside conventional prose. And in the same way that we have to do that with language, you have to do that inside of every organizational structure, every room where people are making decisions together, you have to reset their understanding of that process of decision making because all of it is built on habits that are so old and so deep about who's supposed to defer to whom, who takes precedence, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, I mean, at the end of the day, I, can we transform this? Yes, we can, but only with the same sort of voluminous uh, quantity of work that we have been pouring into this for a very long time. So, you know, are, is deliverance around the corner? No, I don't think so. Um, can we inch by inch, you know, get us closer to a place of genuine equal footing throughout our culture and our organizations? Yes, but again, it's literally inch by inch, person by person, building networks and, and groups working together in this direction. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I asked that question of you all because it's a question I ask myself all the time. Um, all of that really resonates with me. Something that also really resonates with me is when Danielle said, I will not be defeated. Like my whole body like <laughs> <laughs> rang with that. Um, so I think that is how I feel. And so, you know, I think that's the thing that keeps me from um, Afro-pessimism, for example, because I just can't accept that idea. Um, um, but at the same time, I'm very wary, as you say, uh, Kia say, of, of redemption, of jumping straight up to deliverance, right? Um, jumping, jumping straight to redemption um, is, seems very um, counterproductive to me and dishonest and maybe um, the opposite of honoring people's sacrifices. Um, particularly as, as art creators. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Because like, like as an art creator, I think it's I me. Mean, Becoming an artist is almost like going to some elite school. Like people think as soon as you step foot on that school, you are no longer guilty. My students, right? Artists, people are like, are you an artist? Are you an artist? But like most artists work in the service of Tara. I do. Do you know what I'm saying? Like um, a lot of my work, though I try hard as, as hell through revision to, to take that out, right? To make the sentences bounce and, and create rhythm. But also I'm trying to push back and do this work that we all are in the lineage of. But like, if I'm not willing to say and talk about how a paragraph on page four or five of my work is really working in the service of Tara, and some paragraph in our book has to be working in the service of Empire and Tara, because these books are published by major, major corporations. If I'm not doing that work, I can fool myself into believing that like, I am trying to redeem when I'm, <laughs> I can fool myself into believing that I'm somebody that I'm not, which is what Americans are great at. And so I'm just trying to say, when you ask that question, I don't want to jump to this place where like we're the cave crusaders trying to do the work when we are often more villainous than we are cave crusaders, even with our voluminous understanding of, of all of this great art who's come before us. You know, Baldwin, Morrison, Ellison at times, Margaret Walker Alexander at times worked in the service of empire. So if they did. I know I am, too. And I don't want to talk about that part. <laughs> I don't talking about that with y'all because I love you. And so that, that's what I'm saying. Your question is, is, is scary because yes, I want to do the work to liberate. But what I don't want to do is talk about how on the road to liberation, I'm probably going to do some things that people, if they were another hue of me, another class of me, I would critique to death. And I just don't want, I don't, I want part of my work to be not to do that work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I think that you have also kind of put an answer in the question, right? I mean, to me, that suggests that um, if we're to talk about anything like um, reckoning, you know, uh, deliverance, redemption, that we have to be talking about accountability all the time, right? Um, at the same time, right? It, uh, um, and demanding that other people who want to be in conversation, right, in good faith conversation are also talking about it all the time. Right. So that, so, so to me, that, that, that also gives us kind of a method, which I think is, part of what makes that question scary is it's sort of like, oh, I don't trust this whole conversation, but how can we create a conversation in which some kind of trust can be built? Um, and it seems to me that, that that's what you're saying is that, well, we, we have to always also be talking about what it is where, um, 
<laughs> if we always have to be talking about what we're actually doing, what we're serving, who we're hurting, right? Like, like how harm is being produced. Like who, who, who what, ca- what kind of characters am I making sacrifice too much in my art? Un, 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 unknowingly and or knowingly, but the unknowingly part is the part I think as writers and, 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 and explorers of the life of the mind, we have to understand. So, you know, like, we can call it ableism, for example. But if I have characters in my in, in in my in my fiction that walk with a limp, and all they do is walk with a limp, and that's never ever like given anything to me, that person has to sacrifice far more than they should. And I'm not pushing back against anything in the dominant culture. So anyway, my point is that your question really made me question a lot about this cape I want to put on as an artist and a writer that really is not warranted for me from for myself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, but maybe the lesson is, is that we shouldn't be superheroes, right? That we should be human. Right. And this also brings us back to Ellison, right? This is something <laughs> that I uh, that I learned actually from Danielle, right? Um, um, right, is that that if we are really celebrating the human, then we have to be celebrating the parts that are messy and inconclusive right. and contradictory and um, and harmful um, uh, and and you know, it, and, and when we are working to transform, those parts have to be part of the story too, and maybe even the center of the story. Right. Um, and, and certainly even, certainly for this nation, in this national conversation, nice. um, um, it would need, it would need to be. So um, that is where, though, I'm just gonna kind of bring it back in, right? That is, sacrifice comes in there, and that is where love also comes in, from mm-hmm. my point of view. Um, so I just gave you a kind of dark, picture of the sort of thing I think I'm doing, right? So I'm engaged in hand-to-hand combat, right? It's not really how people <laughs> think probably about Danielle, right? Um, and so it really matters to me that even as I'm trying in so many different sort of teeny, teeny, tiny moments to reset a balance of power, um, I, I, you know, I'm sure it sounds hokey and I'm sure a lot of people don't believe me, but I actually like try to pour love into that experience and love mm-hmm. into that work because mm-hmm. the goal at the end of the day is not defeat, total defeat of an adversary. It's not actually a war goal. The goal is actually peace. It's the language I keep using about being on an equal footing. And for me, like, you know, where is true deliverance? Honestly, I I don't think in some sense it's necessarily for me or people who look like me. I think it's for people who are trapped in sort of the entrapments of power and don't realize how stifling and limiting that is to them. And so in that regard, uh, for me, the resetting and the transformation is actually, it is, it's deliverance because equal footing is just a heck of a lot of a healthier place to be from a point of view of mental health for everybody, well-being for everybody. So it matters to me, and this is, you know, this is again very Ellisonian, right, that the love concept is as much at the center of things as the work concept and the struggle concept. And you see that in Cuz, right? I mean, Cuz to me, among other things, read to me as an attempt of you to love your cousin but also love you enough to realize you must, you do bring your cousin through every door you walk through and literally bringing your cousin, bringing your cousin's words and art through all of these doors. was like one of the things that I think people just didn't understand enough about that text, but is like part and parcel of that love tradition that you're talking about. Yeah. You said that in that review and, and you gave me such a gift with those words when you concluded your, your review by saying that my message was, I love my cousin. And if you'd loved him too, he would be here. Right. That's you it. you saw me completely and wholly, and for that I will right. be eternally grateful. <laughs> that was it. That that was it to me. I mean, there was a lot more, but that was that was it to me. So and your book too. I mean, your uh the, your love for your mother and her love for you, you know, they are the rod at the center of the thing, and um there is power in that. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I, I, I want to sort of, um, we're coming to the close, I think, of what we have time for. Um, and I want to point our attention toward the future. Um, and um, I, I'm going to just read little short passages from each one of your books, because this is my sort of way in to this question um, about the future. Kiese writes, For the first time in my life, I realized telling the truth was way different from finding the truth. And finding the truth had everything to do with revising and rearranging words. Revisiting and rearranging words didn't only require vocabulary, it required will. 
and maybe courage, revised word patterns shaped memory. Alan writes, dearly beloved, if you ask yourself why the least among us are not thriving, you can turn the question this way and that. You can push it and you can pull it. But if you are honest, you will have to recognize that there is only one answer. The least among us are not thriving because those at the top have established a parasite and entrapped impoverished communities within it through the systemic application of violence. So what I wanna ask you guys are what are the truths that we need to find to write and discuss and revise in order to get free of the entrapment imposed by the systemic application of violence to our imagined community. I mean, I, I read, I reread this uh, Adrian Rich piece last week. Um, and, and, and at the end of it, she writes, uh, beauty is not sacrificed. Our hearts do not turn, turn to stone. And then there's one more sentence and I think she wanted us to find pleasure and joy in the possibility of hope, right? Of, of resurrection, kind of, sort of. But like, I flipped it in this thing I'm writing, and like, I, like I, I, I do think it's all lost. I think hearts do turn to stone. I think beauty is not just sacrificed, but bought perpetually. Now, once we acknowledge that, for me, the beauty and the discovery comes in understanding the wreckage, building some new stuff from the wreckage, but where I am right now with my family, with this world, with this particular government, everything I was told as a child is lost, was not true. And I just think it's wonderful at finally at 46 years old, I can finally accept that it was all bullshit. Okay, so now what do I do? How do I go about creating like pleasurable practices for me when I'm alone, since I spend so much time alone now? How, am I, how do I become a better friend, a better partner, a liberatory partner? How do I use different words? Like, how do I treat, create a different relationship with my job that is not so carnivorous where they get to eat my success and blah, 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 and I don't have to sacrifice as much for them to get better? All of these things are things I've, I've, I've flirted with, but I've never stepped into. And so for me, the future is filled with discovery because it's lost. Like, and I don't mean that in a, in a, in a pejorative way, you know? My grandma and the, my memory is there. But, but everything I was told is this country is lost. And, and I'm so thankful I finally accept that. So that is a great set of questions and set of thoughts. Um, I guess I wanna go two different directions with it. The first is, um, Diva, to respond to your question about what are the truths we have to tell. It's got, my answer to that has something to do with the concept of magnitude. So for example, in my book, because, you know, it's dedicated to the millions lost. And in some sense, you know, people could be skeptical about that. It's like, you know, what exactly, what number does that represent? You know, is it, is it meant to be just people incarcerated? Is it people who are dead? It's like, what are you trying to say by sort of referring to the millions lost? But in fact, there have been millions of young black lives lost to the prospect of full human flourishing, period, like over the last few decades. And for me, the truth is about recognizing that no explanation of that that isn't equal in magnitude to the magnitude of that loss can be true. Yeah. And I feel like we, so we just spend way too much time <laughs> piddling around in the weeds with these like little explanations of like this little study here and that little study there that sort of try to tell us what happened, right? No, okay, no. we just built a structure of domination and destruction and we did it intentionally and that's it. That's all you need to know. And therefore we have the responsibility to undo it and build something else. So that for me is sort of like that, that kind of concept of magnitude is at the heart of the truth concept for me. Um, with regard to Casey's point about loss, um, that's really powerful and profound. And I mean, um, on one level I wanna second it in the sense that I do think the experience of the pandemic has required us all to go back to the question of the basics of our relations to other human beings and what counts as a healthy human life, and then to kind of work out from there. And I think that is a profound opportunity for all of us. Um, I can see a kind of culture of care, an economy of care that we could all center coming out of that experience. And that is a pretty dramatic transformation from where we've been in this country for the last few decades. So for me, I guess the question there is how to, to harness that experience and, and really 
let it blossom out, grow out, become a cultural resource for a different kind of foundation. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So I know I told you that was the final question, but I wasn't telling the <laughs> truth. I have one more thing that um, I want to ask you all to do. So, um, you know, in my work on the Movement for Black Lives, I have noticed a practice which I think is very interesting um, and very promising um, for us all to do. So I'm going to invite you to do it. So in the Movement for Black Lives, there's this practice at the beginning of meetings and trainings um, with visioning frameworks that encourage people to tell the history of the future. Um, and I just love that idea of telling the history of the future. So what that means is that in the, that those in the room are invited to finish the sentence. Imagine it's 2070 or 2080 or 2100. What is the story that people will tell of this time if we are able to change the trajectory of things in this moment? If we are successful in building the world that we want, how will they tell the story of what happened today? I think they'll say that when the pandemic hit, Americans discovered that they had become addicted to a culture of mutual abandonment and rediscovered in that moment, the alternative of a culture of mutual care and commitment. And not all of them did all at once because there was a lot of fighting and a lot of polarization, but enough of them figured this out and they found each other and they formed a political movement that transformed the legal structure of the country. Yeah, I think, um, I think the history of the future will be and or can be um, that in the face of like unrelenting catastrophe, we all decided to love ourselves and the people we purport to love um, better. And we stopped cheating. And when we got caught cheating, we didn't want to get out of it. We allowed, especially if we were cheating at the expense of vulnerable people, um, the history of the future will be where we take accountability and, and loving accountability for our lack of love. And I think accountability for lack of love is actually like as much as love can do and be. So my history of the future is that we will be much more loving interpersonally and definitely as a nation.